I'm here with our finance partner, um, John Charcoal, joined by Ray Bulger again. And uh, for this video, Ray and I thought we would talk a little bit about refurbishment uh, finance because, um, Ray, clearly, first of all, uh, people cannot use buy-to-let mortgages to undertake a refurbishment. And when we say uh, refurbishment, it's a, it's a very, it covers a lot of ground because there's a fairly, um, you know, small cosmetic or what we call light refurbishment right through to serious development. Clearly, each type of refurbishment is going to need a specialist um, kind of finance. Um, but one thing that, that really is important for people to understand is that the refurbishment arena is is really about cash, isn't it? And that's where bridging loan and specialist products come in. That's right. And it may be worthwhile just explaining why a normal buy-to-let mortgage actually doesn't work in refurbishment. And the reason for that is very simple. Lenders rely on the rental income to support the mortgage. And of course, while you're refurbishing the property, you've got no rental income. So get that out of the way first. So if you're doing light refurbishment, there are a few lenders who will offer a mortgage on the basis that you'll complete the refurbishment within three months. They won't expect any interest payments for three months. Doesn't mean they're not charging you any interest, but they'll allow it to roll up. And um, then they w the other key thing is that they will assess the rental income, which of course will dictate how much you can borrow, on the basis of what the property is going to be like when you've done the refurbishment. So their value will go in, we'll need to see the plans so they know what you're going to do, and then they can make a good assessment of what the rent's going to be. The benefit of going down that route, as opposed to perhaps using a, a bridge, which would be an alternative, is that the costs are significantly less. Yes. You're not going to incur in the bridging loan fees, and you, in fact, you're only going to be incurring one set of fees as well. Mm -hmm. So that can be really useful, providing you've got the cash to do the refurbishment, mm -hmm. um, and you're not going to need to remortgage at the end of the refurbishment term in order to you know, release some cash. Mm -hmm. If, on the other hand, you are buying a property that needs major refurbishment, perhaps even redevelopment, maybe converting a house into two flats, for example, then that sort of project um, will almost certainly need to be financed with a bridging loan, mm -hmm. unless, of course, you're in the position of having enough cash not to need um, to borrow anything other than the original purchase price. Mm -hmm. But assuming you do need to borrow uh, m m some money, then a bridging loan is going to work best for that sort of deal. Mm -hmm. And key things to always watch with a bridging loan, bearing in mind that most bridging loan deals are negotiable. So if you compare it with a normal buy-to-let mortgage, where the lender will set their terms, their rate, their fees, and you either take it or you don't. With a bridging loan, there is negotiation to be done, and this is where a good lender can really help out, because what a bridging loan lender first of all offers may well not be their final uh, offer. A bit like when you're negotiating to buy the property, in fact. Um, and providing it's a, a deal that more than one lender is prepared to do, then, of course, um, one of the things a broker can do, having established which lenders are prepared to offer a loan, is play one off against the other. Uh, so for some borrowers, um, keeping the interest rate as low as possible, or indeed rolling up the interest, will be important. Mm -hmm. For, for others, fees will be more important. So depending on you know, what's most important to the client will depend on how you structure the deal. But essentially, in many cases, what most people will want to do is roll up the interest because after all, they're spending money during the period they're doing the property. So if they've got to pay interest, really, they've got to borrow more money up front. Mm -hmm. So that's the way that I think most deals work best. You uh, uh, t take a sensible view on how long it's going to take to do the refurbishment, build in a margin of error, um, and then borrow sufficient money to cover all your costs, um, allowing for the fact you're going to roll up the interest. And because you're rolling up the interest, that will influence the maximum the lender's prepared to lend you, because, of course, all the time you're rolling up the interest, it pushes up the loan to value. Um, and different lenders will have different risk appetites on, on, on development. Mm -hmm. If you need to borrow a relatively high loan to value, that may be available, but probably only at a higher interest rate. Mm -hmm. So again, looking at whether you can finance part of the cost from some other source, perhaps by remortgaging one of your other buy to let properties, if you've got one, for example, that might be um, a good way forward because it may mean that you can significantly reduce the cost of the bridging finance. Well, I think you've highlighted straight away there, um, Ray, how important it is to work with a broker, not only to work out how to structure the deal in the most efficient way for the client, but also um, if, if you've got sort of 
transactions depending on each other, like doing a remortgage to get some money out and then move on to the refurbishment, how, how the broker can make sure that all that runs, you know, very streamlined and all fits in nicely together. Um, I think, you know, it's important, I think, for the community to realise it, it's when it comes to bridging finance, um, lenders typically like to see somebody with some experience and the question is it's always you know how do you get that experience um, if they won't lend to you to give you the chance to get the experience if you see what I mean so how um, what sort of uh, level of experience do bridging lenders like to see well one way of course of getting that experience might be to team up with somebody else who's done it before point, yeah. so, so it may well be that you're putting in the initial cash mm -hmm. And you're going to be doing a lot of the work, but actually you've got a partner who can satisfy a lender that there's the experience there. Mm -hmm. um, but everybody's got to start somewhere, um, and the less experience you've got, um, probably the bigger the deposit the lender's going to require. Mm -hmm. So if you've got no experience at all, what they're going to be looking for is who you're going to be working with. Mm -hmm. Now, have you got a reputable project manager or QS, it depends what type of deal it is, obviously, as to exactly who you need, um, who are the architects, all this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So if you can demonstrate that even though you've not done it before, you clearly um, understand what the process is and you've got a good team of professionals on board, um, from architects, QS, um, solicitor, um, then that's still going to help. But if you are a novice in the game, you're still probably going to find that the maximum you can borrow is going to be less than somebody who's done it before. Mm -hmm. And will um, lenders take into account single occupancy buy-to-let um, experience as part of that? Um, because it seems to me that actually with the uh, refurbishment, it, it's got very little to do with buy-to-let. It's obviously buy to keep or buy to sell, buy to develop. Um, so how, how do they kind of uh, consider landlord experience? Yes, if you've done refurbishment before, that's a help. But as you say, it's very different to development. Mm -hmm. And so I would say probably for somebody starting off down the development route, they should initially look at small scale development, yes. now, perhaps by a, a house that, needs convert, that you can convert into flats, or maybe the other way around. We see that sometimes as well. Um, once you've done it once, then you're in a much stronger position next time. Mm -hmm. um, and another key thing that um, is worth stressing in terms of how you structure the bridging finance is to make sure you don't get caught out by high exit fees. Yeah. So some lenders will have an arrangement fee up front. Well, all lenders will have an arrangement fee up front. Some will also have an exit fee. Um, if you expect the project to take six months, and the chances are, in that case, it's not going to take less than that. If you have a bridge where there's early repayment charges for only six months, well, that's not going to be a problem, perhaps. Um, so the, the, the bridging lender obviously incurs certain costs in setting up the deal. So they need to make sure they recover their costs, but you need to make sure that you're not going to get caught out at the end of the deal. So watching um, exit fees, early repayment charges is important. And it may well be worthwhile paying a slightly higher rate of interest to have a deal with no early repayment charges, particularly if you're not sure how long you're going to need the bridge for. Because what you've also got to allow for is that when the bridge is finished, mm -hmm. if you're going to retain that property, you need to allow enough time to remortgage. Yep. If you're going to sell it, you need to allow enough time to sell the property. Right. So it's not just it's going to take me three or six months to do this deal. It's I might need a bridging loan for a year or maybe even longer. So all those things need to be taken into account. And there are some products that have very um, high rates that are once you're out of the initial period, if, you, if you're not redeemed the bridge, then they go on to much higher rates. And if that happens, it can really bite into your profit. It's very common in the bridging market to see that the rate after the initial term will treble or even quadruple. <laughs> now, now, if you're in that situation, you can probably do a rebridge. Um, so it doesn't mean you've got to pay those rates. But, but, yes, you clearly want to avoid that. Um, just to finish then, Ray, in, in the current market conditions, um, uh, well, I think one of the most popular strategies is to force the appreciation through refurbishment and then look to refinance and get as much cash out as possible. Um, and this is a key way that people are growing their portfolios in the current more challenging marketing con market conditions. So um, in, in terms of this kind of finance, it really is the holy grail to try and be able to pull back as much cash as possible at the end when you do your, e your refinance at end of term. Uh, of course, and how much you can pull back is going to depend on the quality of the property, mm -hmm. which will dictate how much rent you can get for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so um, the, uh, the amount of mortgage you can get 
will be dictated by rental income, whether you take a five-year fix, whether it's in a limited company name, all the things that affect how much you can borrow will come into play here. Mm -hmm. And if you're buying the property initially through a limited company, then if you're going to retain the property to rent out, then you're probably going to want to retain it in the limited company. Mm -hmm. Clearly, you're going to be creating more value. So the last thing you're going to want to do in most cases is sell it to yourself mm -hmm. or if you buy it in your own name sell it to a limited company because then you're going to be creating more tax incur more stamp duty etc mm -hmm. so before you buy the property think about what the end game is mm -hmm. is the end game to sell it for a profit is the end game to keep it and rent it out and if you're going to keep it are you going to keep it in a corporate structure or in your own name mm -hmm. I think what I'm taking away from all of this, Ray, is you've actually got to be very clear from the start um, the structure of your finance and how you're going to refinance when the time comes. Um, it wouldn't be very prudent to kind of wait till the end and then sort of think about what you're going to do. You've got to really think about it right at the beginning. And again, this is where John Charcoal can help. And this is a question the lender's going to ask as well, because whereas for a normal mortgage that you're servicing from the rental income, the basis of how much you can borrow is what rent you're getting. Mm -hmm. With a bridging loan, that's not an issue because there's no income. With a bridging loan, the key thing the lender's going to be looking for is what the exit strategy is. So they are going to want to know what your exit strategy is. Mm -hmm. And whether that's that you keep the property and rent it out or sell it mm -hmm. doesn't matter, but they will want to know that. So mm -hmm. if you haven't really thought that through, we do sometimes get clients saying, mm, don't really know. Well, um, you need to have a view on that. And if the view changes because the market changes, fine. But, but if you're not upfront on that, it's actually going to straight away tell the lender that perhaps they shouldn't be lending to that person because they haven't really got the confidence in what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Indeed. So lots to consider if you're thinking of undertaking a refurbishment product project. And of course, the team here at John Charcoal are here to assist the Property Tribes community. And um, you're quite happy for people to call up and just ask for a bit of free advice, aren't you? Absolutely. All the advice is free. Um, so what we like to do where we can is see clients face to face, because it's much better to actually sit down and discuss some, uh, the proposition with somebody face to face. But that's not always possible for people who are not close to one of our offices so we can do things over the phone but the initial stage is to understand what the client's looking for we can then advise them as to what the options are mm -hmm. and our fee only becomes payable if they press the button and say yes I'd like you to go ahead and arrange that mortgage for me. Fantastic well thank you very much for sharing those insights it's been very interesting Ray thank you. Mm -hmm.